Okay. All right, so we're going to start off by discussing Rabbit 2007, which was a reading assignment actually from last week, so hopefully you remember it yet. Um, and then we're going to go off to Turtles Island, and the topic for today is for us to appreciate wetlands. And then don't forget that next week we have one last field trip. We're going to go to Hot Woods, and we're going to wear waders next week. So if the weather is nice, then don't, make sure that you wear socks because to our readers, you have to have your socks on. Um, and if it's cold and miserable, make sure that you dress appropriately because we're going to go out there unless there's a hurricane. <laughs> um, it's a really, really pretty place. And where we're going today is really pretty too. Hopefully we'll get to see some, some pumpkins and a lot of other birds, all the other sections too, so I can be able to. All right. So, to start off with our discussion, I first would like to ask you, how many of you someday, or if you weren't already, maybe, would like to have waterfront property? Waterfront property. How many definitely do not ever want to live on waterfront? Why? <laughs> Too expensive. Too expensive. Or what if you had all the money that you ever would wish for? Yeah. No? Still no? Why wouldn't you? If you go by Lake Winnebago in May, you got the Mayflies. I don't think so. <laughs> the Lake, lake Flies. Yeah. But you know, Lake Winnebago is actually an exception. A lot of, most of the other lakes don't have Lake Flies. So what if it's a different but, water body? But everybody is so compacted there. It's like, so that's just Canada water There you go. Yeah. Why does Lake Winnebago have so many Lake Flies? Uh, there are actually relatively few lakes that have so many, they're called chironomids, so that species of the genera. The genera. Um, the, uh, why exactly? I guess that's that's the debate of a lot of ecologists as to why Lake Winnebago has a lot of lake flies. There's a lot of speculation that maybe they didn't always have so many lake flies. Um, it may have to do with uh, Oshkosh being sawdust city, city and bringing in all of the you know the waste, the sawdust into the lake, and that may have increased the lake fly population to this day. Uh, we really don't know, but I'll tell you what, those lake flies are important because they are supporting our fishery. Lake sturgeon absolutely require them to survive. Mm -hmm. So they are important, and I know they're a nuisance, but um, think of them as part of the ecosystem and they need to be there. All right, so for those of you that want to live on the shoreline, tell me why. What do you, yeah, yes. I want a jet ski. I just you want to go crazy on a thing like that. Maybe the other day. <laughs> you want a jet ski. Yes. All right. Yes. What do, you want, what do you want your shoreline property to look like? Um, a beach, maybe a cliff in the distance. Beach, sand. You yeah. want sand, you want a cliff in the distance. Yes. All right. What do you? What do you? Would you? Do you want trees or anything like that? Because um, you just a second ago you said you wanted to be up in the north woods. Maybe, maybe a couple willows in the corner. Willows. But otherwise, okay. Like, you know, just whatever. I, I like nature being what it is. Okay. Okay. Except for that cliff. Nature being sand. what it is. <laughs> so you like to leave things alone. So that's a cliff in the sand. Yeah. Okay. What if there is no sand there naturally? What are you going to do? Just a big, big truckload of sand in? <laughs> That's called a sand blanket. You can get a big fine for that. You can't do that. <laughs> Believe me, a lot of people try. Um, who else would like to live on a on waterfront property? And tell me what you'd like it to look like. Give me, give me your vision of where you'd like to be somewhere. A beach, okay, and a hammock. So you don't want any bugs, of course. Oh, no. right, so if you're going to have a hammock, you probably need trees. Not necessarily, though, but do you think you want some trees? Okay. Anybody else? How do you, how do you picture? How, how do you want the water to, what do you want the water to be like? Uh, yes. I want the water to be, like, kind of green, but blue, like, in, like, the middle of the ocean. Like, it's kind of shallow, and you can see really far in the distance and watch all the pretty tropical fish. So you want it, the water to be clear? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other visions of what you want your shoreline property to look like? Andre? Even though I don't want to, but if I could, I would choose to live next to St. Germain because mm -hmm. the water's clear blue, blue, and it's very pretty up there, actually. Okay. Okay. So that's up north? Yeah. Okay. So I hear everybody wants to have clean water. Uh, most people want to have sand. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, thinking about the article, Beauty and the Beach, does somebody want to just basically tell me in a couple of sentences what it's about, Beauty and the Beach? And I selected this article because it is about shoreline property. And shoreline property, property 
that buffer between the water and transitioning onto the land, that is essentially a small wetland. So the value of wetlands and the value of shorelines are, are pretty much one and the same thing. So Ted, do you want to tell us what the article is about? Uh, yeah. I think the article is talking about the vegetation around the Lake, uh, Lake Michigan. Um, however, people, uh, and they said the vegetation is good for uh, preventing soil erosion. However, uh, people still want sand. Yes. So there's a conflict between these two. Right. Yeah. So the problem is the the great well water levels naturally fluctuate, and Lake Michigan has been down in recent years. It's been down for quite a long time, and the people that own the municipalities and the people that own property around the lake they want to know well what can we do with this extra property, and especially the municipalities they want to know how can we maybe bring some extra income into our community through this beach. We want to develop this. We want to turn it into volleyball and and cookouts and bring people there so we can make some money, right? Well, what they're trying to convince them, and this was in Two Rivers, they were being approached by the city manager, and they wanted um, the city manager and the DNR and some other people got together, and they're trying to convince them that really the best thing to do is to keep that natural vegetation on the beach. So let's make a list of the uh, values of a natural shoreline. So Ted, you had mentioned erosion, so we can do erosion first. And erosion happens either by wind or by water, so wind or waves. Okay. So a natural shoreline. So when we're talking about a natural shoreline, we're talking about native plants. And it's not in our, you know, in our culture to let weeds grow, right? So native plants. I'm going to draw. Here's some. Here's a. Here's the land. I'm going to draw some big old weedy native plants that usually grow pretty tall and have some, you know, they're just usually considered only ungainly and unruly, and they're just all over the place. And they're big plants, and they're adapted to living in our region. They have really long root systems. Some, in some cases, they've been documented they have more than 20, 24 feet of roots. Okay? So these roots and all this vegetative matter up here, that helps to hold either the soil or the sand onto the shoreline. Okay? Whether it be wind or waves, it still helps hold it there. And I mean, how many of you like to have sand blowing in your face? All right? How many property owners want to have their shoreline road away into the lake? They want to save their property, right? And they'll usually battle it because um, the tradition has been, well, let's rip out all this native stuff that's all grown all over the place, unruly, and let's grow a sod lawn. And, well, the other roots just look like on a sod lawn. Yeah, it's like this. You can take sod, if you ever try to pull any of it out, you can just roll it up like a carpet. Ain't the roots don't hang in there at all. All right, well, they have a sod, and they want to keep their property. And then when they put in the sod, then they find out after years and years, as waves are coming in, and they're just washing away their property and just taking it away. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I'm losing my property. What can I do? And um, then they might get a permit to put in riprap, which is rocks on their shoreline. And these rocks, actually, the DNR is tr they'll, they'll still often give you a permit to put those rocks in. But it's, they figured out that those rocks really aren't the best habitat to have on these lakes. And we see these rocks lying all over the place. And then through the cities, uh, you'll even see, and seawalls now are not permitted at all, but through the cities in the old days, they used to put in a seawall. So here's a wall. I mean, how is a, how is a frog or a turtle or anything that needs to you know, transition between you know, the aquatic and the terrestrial environment, how are they going to get up, if they're down here in the water, how are they going to get up on land? And oh, never mind, that's probably just a parking lot up here. There's probably no habitat up there anyway. And remember that the number one reason why we are losing species so quickly is because of the loss of habitat. Right now, we are a thousand times above background levels of extinction. We are the next big asteroid. Humanity is the next big asteroid, asteroid to hit the planet. We are in a mass extinction event right now. Okay, so that's erosion. Can you give me another benefit of having a natural shoreline, Christian? They have those rare species of animal, like plant life and uh, aquatic stuff, like right down the shoreline. Because I remember hearing like there was like a, 
ecological guy that went on a walk and found a whole bunch of them that should be a good reason to get the shoreline. Okay. okay, so there are a lot of rare species that only live on the beach. And if we're, you know, if we're tilling up our beach to have it be nice and sandy so that there's, you know, there's no weeds in our way when we try to play volleyball, we lose those species. So what I'm going to put here is biodiversity. It increases biodiversity. It preserves native species, and again, some native species, this is the only place that they're going to grow is right on that transition zone between the water and the land. Um, and it does that by providing, I'm going to put um, three here, by habitat. So we have all these, these native plants, and then plus in the water, you probably got some, some plants in here too. Uh, that habitat is the basis, of the, those plants are the basis of the food chain. Um, almost all trophic uh, food webs begin with photosynthesis. You need to have the plants, you need to have the algae, because they harvest energy from the sun and they're at the bottom of the food chain. These plants then will feed bugs, sometimes fish will eat them, and then bugs are fed upon by amphibians, by turtles, by fish, by birds, and so on and so forth down the food chain. If you don't have these plants, you don't have the animals. You have to think about the connection of things. Um, so the plants, the natural, the natural plants are providing habitat. They're also <coughs> providing places, their nursery grounds for baby fish. Uh, little fish, they're, they're very vulnerable to the big fish, so they hang out at the shorelines and the wetlands. Uh, in order to be protected from the big fish because they can't come into that shallow water. And they'll hang out in these weeds where they're fairly safe from the big fish and they're somewhat safe from the birds that might prey on them. And they hide there and they eat the little bugs in there until they get big enough so that they can go out into the open water. All right, uh, how many of you like to fish? All right, so this is your, your little fish. I mean, you, big fish come from little fish and this is where your little fish come from. Okay. So many people, they want to pull out all these weeds because they're in the way of their boats. Well, you know, they don't have to take a boat out if you're a fisherman if you, there's no fish out there in the first place. All right, another benefit of a natural shoreline. There's a few more. How many others that you can think of? Flood. Oh, uh, flood control? Flood control, yes. <coughs> so, especially when we're talking about wet, wetlands, um, these root systems act like sponges. Remember how we studied transpiration at the beginning of the semester? Well, these are big plants. They have lots of surface area. So there's lots and lots of water being pumped up through these plants and back out into the air. So when there is extra water, these roots will take in that extra water and release it back up into the air pretty, pretty quickly. Whereas if you have this little lawn here, it isn't going to do much. It isn't going to do much at all. And in some situations, um, there have been places, and I, I, in specific, I studied the uh, Kinnikinnik River in Milwaukee, where they had filled in wetlands all around this, this river system. And then, and then, if that wasn't bad enough, they channelized it with cement. They made it straight, and they lined it with cement. Not much habitat there, nothing for plants to grow on, and uh, very filthy, dirty water. And that whole idea was to treat it like a ditch, treat that water like wastewater, get it off the land as fast as possible. Well, then you know what happened? Without these wetlands, these wetlands were gone. They there was no reservoirs for extra water when it rained a lot, so they had a lot of flash floods. And I actually did research. I was looking up newspaper articles about people that died, children that died that had been playing down by the, by the river, and they got swept away because there was a flash flood. All right? So um, it helps prevent floods to have these natural plants there. Another benefit of having a natural shoreline. Yeah. It helps keep like the beach from from getting um water that stinky algae. Okay. Excellent. So um, nutrient management. <coughs> As we've studied in class this semester, uh, nutrients cause algae blooms. Well, these plants they not only take up water, but they take up a lot of extra nutrients. And so when it's raining and all those nutrients that might be coming off people's pocket, whether it be just, you know, debris like leaves, things like that, or maybe pet waste or fertilizers that they're putting on their, their land, um, these plants are going to eat it up and not let those nutrients get in the water in the first place to cause an algae bloom. Now, I didn't hear anybody say, I want to live on a lake that's all cloudy and dirty, right? Anybody want to live on that? Nobody wants to live on that. And plus, if you think about it, 
these plants, they need to have sunlight to grow in the water, and if the water's all cloudy, these plants are not going to live. Right? Because sunlight is not going to be able to penetrate the water. All right, can you think of any other benefits? I have at least one more benefit I want to add. Think of any more? I like to add aesthetics. What is a beautiful shoreline? I mean, most of the time when people talk about that they want to live on a shoreline property, they talk about, oh, I want to, I want to see clear water, and I, mean, I want to see birds, and, and I, I want to see a nice, clean habitat. I don't hear anybody say uh, they want to see dirty water, and they, uh, they want all the fish to be dead. And <laughs> Uh, but you do you have to put up with insects if you want to have fish. You've got to, you've got to put up with some of those things that we don't like so much if you want to have those other things. And I always like to give the scenario of you've got, this, hap this has happened in many, many lakes where up north there's a lake and it's previously undeveloped so there's no settlement all around it and I'm going to draw a bunch of trees forested up north Wisconsin. And here's, so it's maybe it's a small lake, maybe one, maybe four acres. And a developer buys a property here, maybe a couple developers buy the properties around the lake, and they sell them off piece by piece. And they lot them off, there's all the lots. And so, you know, the first one's lotted off, and they build a house, cut down all the trees, and then they maybe plant a tree from Japan right here. And um, the, so they can see the water, right? Well, then the next guy, he does that too, and just piece by piece, they just take it apart. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit here, and then he's got his dock, and he's got his dock, and then a big boat right here, and pontoon boat maybe, and um, house after house does this. And pretty soon, the whole reason that these people wanted to live up on the northern lake, while well, this lake, all the um, uh, fertilizers and pesticides are sticking on their lawns now, all of that's washing off into the lake, and the algae blooms, and their boats with the waves are causing all the sediment to be stirred up, and you lose those plants, and then Pretty soon you don't have the fish that you once had. People complain that the fish population is down, there's no fish. And you lose the whole reason that people moved up there in the first place. And if you look at Lake Winnebago, I mean, that's a prime example. If you've ever driven, taken a boat along the shoreline to nearby Oshkosh, you go after lawn, after lawn, after lawn, with the rock right at the end of it, with these perfectly manicured lawns. Um, that obviously are being treated with fertilizers and pesticides. You can tell pretty readily if a lawn's treated with pesticides because there's no leaves growing in it. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to get people to change their perspective on what is a beautiful shoreline. There have been some movements, there have been some people that have gone back through and they have restored the native vegetation on the land. It's a big project. Now these, these uh, more northern lakes that were previously undeveloped, um, they follow, they are under different, different rules, different regulations, because they're new. Um, they're, whereas in Lake Winnebago, those properties are all grandfathered in. Uh, here now we have regulations that you can only, um, you can only develop about a third of your shoreline property. Okay, so they have to leave. They have to leave some native vegetation along the sides. They can only develop a lot. They can only grow grass about a third of the channel down. So, and then there's, of course, regulations on how far away you can build your, your house and, or any building from the water. Lots of regulations that you have to follow now if you're on, on a shoreline. And we've only recognized this after we've, we've destroyed what we had. And we've seen case after case after case of the quality of these lakes degrading. Uh, so, do you have any other comments that you'd like to make about the reading? All right. So, I didn't think so. Uh, so we're going to go out to Tyrells Island, and we're going to talk about wetlands in general, and um, the goal of this field trip is for you to gain some appreciation of wetlands, because uh, wetlands have not always been considered a valuable part of, of the world, and they are. So. Uh, Island! Joke's on you! Not an island. I don't know why they call it an island. <laughs> uh, it may have at one time. I speculate it was an island at one time. Um, there is a home. Well, and now it's now it's the Butamar Conservation Club's well house. Uh, but there, it was a residence at one time, and perhaps it was not on an island. And then they just they filled in and made a driveway to it. And normally I do take the bus down there, uh, but I was told that the road is flooded, so we're going to be down here this time. Normally, too, I would take you walking down this path, but I have been down and I would suspect it's extremely muddy, so instead we're going to walk through the break wall. Okay, so um, let's talk about that break wall. There is a 
about a three, if you look in your lab manual on page 90, it shows you uh, an aerial photo of them building, constructing this break wall, which took several years. I believe it was finished in 1998. It took millions of dollars. How many? $2.5 million dollars. And to make this three mile long wall of rock in the lake. <coughs> Why would they spend so much money and so much effort into putting this big, long wall of rocks in the lake? There's a, a, a white egret up there. That's cool. I get distracted really easily when we're out here, so you know I'll be like, tiny squirrel. <laughs> All right. Um. So anyway, why do you think they they wanted to put that in? Why do you think they it was worth that much to them? Isn't that kind of ridiculous? I mean, this is the wall of the lake. What's, what's its function? Why would they spend so much money to do that? Why is it so important? Well, the land manual kind of says it increased biodiversity, so... Yes! Alright. Because Wisconsin has lost about 50% of its wetlands. In the United States, the 48 states have lost about half of their wetlands. And only in hindsight, after we've lost these wetlands, have we realized their value and functions. So, uh, at one time, if, if you look at the, there's another map in your lab manual. It shows you the general area. It's um, on page, I believe, 92, the top of page 92. It shows you Lake Winnebago, which is where Oshkosh is, on the Fox River. If you follow the Fox River up, you go into Lake Butamore. We are on the second end of Butamore, of Winnebago, Winnebago. We're on the second end of Winnebago on Lake Butamore. And if you keep going up, you'll go to the Upper River Pool Lakes. Lake Butamore, Lake Poygan, and Lake Winnicani are up here. And these were predominantly wetlands at one time. If you look at the map right below that, that modeled area, that modeled area was all at one time wetland, and today it is open water. So we've lost about half of the wetlands up here. Okay? And at one time, this was a very, well, it still is a popular place to duck hunt, but we don't harvest nearly as many ducks as we had at one time. So, um, they built this wall to restore a wetland, okay, because we recognize how valuable this, that wetland was that we lost. And, uh, where was I going with that? Um, they, what, what it is, is a break wall. It breaks waves. So, if you've got a long uh, area of water, there's wind that blows over that, and the more fetch that you have, the more your waves will roll, and it prevents vegetation from establishing. It causes uh, sediment to be stirred up, and it also um, bolts that are coming through they create a wake, and they do the same thing. So it doesn't allow any plants to become established. Also, today we have a common carp in this area, and uh, it was introduced right around the year 1900. It was brought here from Europe to be a food source. And, um, well, as you know, many of us don't eat carp. Some people might actually eat it as smoked, but we don't rely on it as a major food source. But it got into the Winnebago Lakes, and it causes a lot of habitat destruction. One of the benefits of the wall is there's one place where you can get in. Okay, you, can't, you can walk on the wall, but you can't walk all the way around because you have to swim part of it. There is talk about making a, a hiking or running path or even biking trail around this, uh, around the wetland, but right now there's a cart barrier where people bring in their boats. You just have to turn off your motor and lift the rod to come in. So anybody can come in here and, and, and get their own fish. Uh, but it's a cart barrier. It prevents cart from getting in. Okay. So this area is managed by Beatlemore Conservation club in conjunction with the DNR. They come up here all the time and make improvements like this trail, this bridge, and uh, plant uh, plant uh, different different wetland plants and can help to control invasive species. Uh, and they have their meetings down at the clubhouse. Alright, so talking about wetlands in general, there are a lot of different kinds of wetlands. We have marsh wetlands, which are open areas. We've got swamp wetlands, which are wooded areas that are really shady, with some swamp monsters lurk. Uh, we also have list of several of them in your lab minute. We have bogs, which are only found in the northern hemisphere. They have any of you ever walked on a bog before? 
Yeah, so this is kind of fun. It's kind of springy, but you gotta be careful because if the water is deep, you might fall all the way through and not find your way up again. So they also be careful on a bog. Um, a fen is an area where it's a unique ecosystem because a fen is spring fed and it has mineral fish, usually with magnesium or calcium, and it's a popular place for ecologists and botanists to go because there's certain species that only live in those areas. Uh, a muskeg is similar to a bog. It's uh, they have it's characterized by floating mats and snag them. Then we have prairie potholes. A prairie pothole is an area that's been scoured up by the glaciers. We have the largest one that's east of the Mississippi River, only about a 20 minute drive from here at Rush Lake. Uh, Rush Lake is um, an area of another wetland restoration. It used to be a really, really popular place to go for duck hunting. It still is. But the problem was that the water levels were managed so that they were so high and there was so much farming going on around the area that it just became algae and tons of algae and uh, it just it was so degraded that they ended up doing this big restoration project. They lowered the water levels and uh, they killed all the carp and then they brought the water levels back up again. They got some vegetation established and they, and they restored the wetland there too. It's another really good story about wetlands. Okay, and then the slough is the last one on your list, and the slough is an area that's kind of like a river, but it's really slow moving, kind of a back channel, and it's usually characterized by real, real uh, shallow water. You know, a lot of people think, well, they want to dredge that out so that they can have their boats go along that, but the thing is, a lot of, a lot of animals, a lot of waterfowl in particular, they rely on waiting to catch their prey, and if you're dredging it out and making it deeper, they, they don't have enough habitat. And also, when you're dredging things out, you're, you're, you're killing all the bottom of the Okay, um, so the history of, wet, of, of wetlands. We've already talked about we've lost most of them. What if we lost most of our wetlands, too? Any ideas? There's a pie chart. Yeah. Would it be like cities and farms? Uh, farms, agriculture. If you look, there's a pie chart. I believe it's on page 98. And it shows you that we've lost 50 some percent of our wetlands to cranberry bogs and then another 10 percent or so to just agricultural in general. Uh, wetlands have been um, considered valuable for agriculture because in part they have uh, your soils are very, very fertile. <laughs> Uh, I've had bad luck in this area finding some good wetland soil, but let me see. I noticed some real dark stuff down here. Let me see if I can. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you've got some wetland soil down here. All right, so notice this water is really wet. The water, the soil is really wet and um, really dark looking. Not particularly stinky. Uh, usually, wetland soil is really stinky. Have you ever walked through a marsh and like notice it's really stinky? That's because of all the anaerobic, the anaerobic decomposition causing the gases like hydrogen sulfide to come up, uh, rotten egg gas. Um, because the, wa the soil is waterlogged, the decomposition only happens very, very slowly, and that leaves a lot of nutrients left in the soil. So that explains why if you can drain the water off of a wetland, uh, they can do it by ditching and tiling and creating berms. Um, they use that soil for growing food. And it's a really, really good fertile soil for agriculture. So most of our wetlands have been lost to agriculture. Anybody want to take a closer look? Sometimes I've had to go on and have to smell, but... Yeah, okay. Um, so why did we lose these, these wetlands here, though? We lost these wetlands because... Oh, nice bit. Look at all the pelicans. Wow. it, uh, the, the waterways were the highways. They had trains and they had ships and that was their way to transport a lot of their, a lot of goods. 
and they did float a lot of logs from the Wolf River down here down to Oshkosh, which is Sada City. Well, when they flooded the water in this area, they raised the water about three feet. It's remained about three feet higher than natural level since around the 1850. And it took decades and decades to lose all the wetland. We didn't lose a wetland overnight. Uh, there, if you go to the Oshkosh uh, Public Museum, you can see some, um, there's old photographs, they show you these big wetland mats that had actually broken off from up here and floated down to Oshkosh, and there would be like right by the bridge there in Oshkosh, right by like where Fratello's is now, they actually used to blow those mats up with dynamite because there's no other way to get them out of the water. And you can also see um, some photos, or well some paintings of, like, they show like people in canoes harvesting wild rice in this area, and you won't find wild rice around here like well, had historically been because of the unnatural way that they've managed water levels. We've lost all of that. They have tried to reestablish wild rice here, but they have not had but well, I can see that very much. Okay, um, so today we recognize that wetlands are so important that we actually, they are very, very heavily protected. And in order to determine if you have a wetland, you have to, um, Delineate your wetlands. Okay, and I often ask this question. This question. I say, I'll ask, uh, um, what is wetland delineation and what is it based on? Okay. Wetland delineation is just defining the line where the wetland starts. And in order to do that, you have to hire a professional. I actually took a weekend workshop on this one, so it is quite the job to delineate a wetland. You have to look at three things. You have to look at water, you have to look at soil, and you have to look at plants. soil charts and there are just hundreds of different kinds of soils. So it's a big process to, to determine what kind of soils you have on this, on this property. They'll go around, they'll take kits, soil uh, probes, and they'll look at the soil types. And uh, I've already talked about them being hydric soils. So they're waterlogged and decomposition happens slowly and you have um, lots of nutrients that make it desirable for agriculture. Um, as far as the water goes, where does the water come from? The rain! And? And springs. So it comes from the sky and it comes from the ground. And you have to consider, the, the reason for that question is consider that all of the streams and, and uh, rivers that are flowing into this area, yeah, we have the Wolf River, we have the Fox River, uh, and then all those streams and creeks that are flowing into that, we've got Blue Creek and Vegas Creek and uh, um, spring. Uh, there, there are just there's so many different waterways that are filtering in here. And think about like all the land that they're draining. It's predominantly agriculture around here, so they're bringing in lots of nutrients. And as you might have noticed, Lake Winnebago is all green in the summer. If you've ever been out there. Uh, and the water levels do still fluctuate. Uh, there's a question here, what is the freak, how does the frequency and duration of flooding determine the types of plants that dominate an ecosystem? Well, uh, and it shows you a chart of the up and down water levels, okay? Well, the, the way that they manage the water is not natural. When do you expect the highest water levels to be? In the spring, right? With all the snow melting and all the runoff. Well, the water levels are high in the spring and then in the summertime, they're supposed to go down gradually, right? They don't do that here. They keep those water levels up for all the recreational boating. So, 
we never see the water levels go down, and that prevents a lot of plants from establishing and finishing their life cycle. And wild rice is one of them that's heavily impacted by that. Um, so with this unnatural water level regime, some species just, they, they haven't evolved to, to live with that. They need to have changing water levels to complete their life cycle. And then the excess water. Well, if there's wetlands, then of course those wetlands are going to take in that excess water. And if there are not wetlands, then you're going to end up with floods. Okay, so we've talked about the water and the soils. What about the plants? Well, if you take any terrestrial plant and you put it in the water, you put it in some really wet soil, it's going to drown, right? All right, so you can easily drown a plant. Aquatic plants have special adaptations to be able to survive in the water. Um, for one thing, they generally don't have much for root systems because they don't have to pull the nutrients from the soil. The nutrients diffuse directly into the cells. They also don't have to have much of a vascular system because uh, they don't have to put, pull those nutrients around. The, nut the nutrients are coming directly into the cells and it's the same thing with gases. So the gases that the plant requires to survive the, the gas is diffused directly into the cells. And that's why you won't find too many underwater plants that get very big because uh, they, don't, they don't have a vascular system. They also don't have much of a cuticle. If you've ever looked at just a leaf on a, on a tree, you notice it's got this waxy cuticle. Well, that's to prevent water loss. That's not the issue with the underwater plants. And in fact, that would be a barrier to preventing nutrients and gases from getting in. They also aren't very rigid. They need to flow with the water because if they didn't do that, they would, they would, they would snap and break off. Um, they don't have stomata. If you remember studying transpiration, uh, they don't ha need to have those holes for taking in releasing gases because, again, it's diffusing in and out directly into the water. And then the last thing, you'll see with the emergent plants, like the cattails and the sedges and some of the grasses, they're in saturated soils, and many many trees and plants would die in that situation. They would they would drown. But they have what are called aerinchyma. You can see the cross section in the lab manual of um, the air spaces that you would find. Um, and that allows them to take those gases down to the root system that they need. There um, there are actually some insects that are specialized to um, drill into the those stems of those plants under the ice in the winter that they can obtain air. Um, so it's kind of neat how to see this uh, co-evolving species like that. And they rely on the air income to survive. Okay, so those are the three uh, things. The, the um, wetland delineator has to look at the, um, the kinds of plants that are in an area. So, you know, there's hundreds of species of plants that they might be considering, hundreds of species of soil that they might be considering. And the species of soil, types of soil. Um, so it's a big job, and it takes a really long time to figure out where the boundaries of a wetland are. And again, we do that because they're so heavily regulated, and there's only so much that you can do in a wetland. You can't build anything, you can't dig, you can't fill it. Uh, it's generally the only thing you can do with it is hunting habitat. Uh, the next topic is wetland succession. We're going to talk about wetland, wetland succession, and then we're going to take our walk on the break wall, and then we'll come back and talk about symbiosis in the web of life. Okay, so wetland succession. First of all, it is um, a circular process. It is not linear. I often ask this as a question, this question too. It's circular. Um, so it looks like it's linear on the, on the, in the lab manual. And you can see on page 90, page 99 shows you uh, the different species. And I would never ask you what the species are, but just to give you an example of what you would be seeing around here. So we start off with an open water situation and it gradually fills in. In the open water situation, you've got plants that are submergent, okay? So, unfortunately, you can't see much here. Uh, in a good habitat, you want to see some plants. You want to see things like Elodea, you want to see Coontail, you want to see Ballasneria, which is also called wild celery. There are a lot of uh, 
floods and a lot of waterfowl that rely on these things in order to survive. Um, then you have your floaters. Those would be like lily pads, maybe pickerel weed, maybe arrowhead, although arrowhead might be considered um, emergent. Uh, they will generally have some kind of a waxy cuticle on top because they're actually breaking the surface. Then you have your um, emergents, so your cattails, your sedges, and some of your grasses, uh, which we talked about, they have the erinchyma. Then you have your wet terrestrials. And these are the ones that, or if you're growing a, a rain garden, or if you're trying to reestablish a natural shoreline, this is the ones that tell you to plant. So these would be things like Joe Pie weed, and bone set, and cardamom flower. And we've, in the past we've called these weeds, but we're recognizing how important that they are that they're supporting our native species, they're supporting our native bugs, they're supporting especially caterpillars. Our birds rely on caterpillars so they can bring them out. Uh, so we need to have these native plants in place. Uh, then we have shrubs. Anybody know what this shrub is? Just notice there's this red, you can see it all over this red shrub. Very, very common around here. Anybody know what it is? It's red osier dogwood. Red osier dogwood. Uh, you'll also see some willows and some shrubby willows around here. These are the common shrubs you see. You'll see some back in kind of a small tree, maybe a shrub. Those are growing right here. Uh, sumac grows just about anywhere. Wetland areas. The dogwood generally you're only going to find in wetter areas, and many of these willows you'll only find in wetter areas. Okay, then you have your three levels of trees. Okay, your three levels of forest. You've got your pioneer species, you've got your intermediate, and then you've got your climax species. The pioneer species of trees are ones that grow really fast. They don't tolerate shade very well. They're the first ones that are going to grow uh, when there's a when there's an opening. Uh, these would be like your willows, like crack willow, the bigger willows, and cottonwoods they have really soft, soft wood because it grows fast. And if you yeah, if you would burn this wood, it burns up very fast. Whereas then you work your way through the intermediate trees and then the, and then the, the uh, climax trees, which have really hard, dense wood. Those would be like your oaks and your basswoods and your pickeries, uh, woods that are much more dense, and they're going to last a long time when you burn them. There are some woods that are so dense that, and they grow so slowly that if you threw a stick in the water, it would sink. Well, most most wood we, that we know floats, but there are some species of trees that the wood is so dense that if you throw a stick in the water, it'll actually sink. Okay, so in succession, I said it was circular, right? It's not linear. So things tend to go towards land, from open water to land. You know, what open water generally fills in. But the reason it does not stay a linear process is because of Disturbances. So disturbances might be, you know, just animals like muskrats. We're going to learn about a little bit how they go through and they um, they'll take out vegetation or or beavers. They'll come in and build a dam. Um, Whether you have got storms, you've got flooding events, you've got uh, ice shoves, you've got wildfires, all sorts of things that will may help bring it back to open water stage again. So it's considered. Succession is considered circular, not linear, because of disturbances. Um, and then, of course, we have people, too, that cause quite a bit of disturbance, more than any other species. Okay, um, one last thing about the water. We measure water clarity using a second disc. Now, if you're in a boat, you would use this thing. You would lower this down off the side of your boat in the shadow. And you would lower it down until you can just barely see the disc. And then you measure the distance from the disc to the, to the top of the water. So you just pull it up on your string and then you measure how much that is. Well, in some situations, if you're taking the water clarity, say on the shore like this, um, you have to use a different version. This is called a turbidity tube. And there's actually a small secchi disc at the bottom of it. You see there's like a black and white thing. Unfortunately, there's algae in there. so. What you do is you release the water down to the point where you can start to see the disc. And I can see it all ready. I don't even have to release any water. Um, and I'm at let me see here, one, two, 103 centimeters. Let's take a look. You can 
actually look down that hole to see if it's like a black and white disc on the bottom. So pass it around and take a look. What we're going to do, remember that number, 103 centimeters. I'm going to take the turbidity tube out with us on the brake wall and I'm going to take a sample of the water clarity out in the, uh, in the lake. And we're going to see it's quite a bit dirty, dirtier. Um, and that's again, the function of this brake wall is helping to prevent the sediment from getting stirred up so the plants can get established so they can get in. Alright, any questions on anything that we've talked about so far? Question? No? Sure? Okay. Um, what we're going to do is go for a walk. And the objective is to <coughs> notice as much as you can. Use all of your senses. That's one thing that's, that's about being outside is you can hey, some some experts say that you have more than 30 senses. And we talk about the five senses, but you may have many, many more senses than that that you can tap into. And when you're outdoors, you're using more than your, your typical senses that you use indoors. So the, the purpose of this walk is to do an observational study. And what I'd like you to do is when we stop, I'm going to ask you, well, what species did you see? Um, just or what did you hear? We're just going to talk about you know, what you know, what we what we sensed as we've gone along on our walk. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the smilins that they used to have uh, in the middle of the brake wall, which they actually recently got rid of. I'll explain all that. All right. Let's um let's go for a walk.